Hello and welcome to our webinar designed to give you some tips on what to consider before you purchase your dream multi hole. Thank you all for joining in. My name is Rachel Crook. I'll have to look after the marketing for multi hole solutions. And before I hand you over to the stars of the show, Tim and Sandy, I'd just like to give you a rundown on how GoToWebinar works, which is the system that's on your screen at the moment. You will see a little control panel to the right hand side of your screen. It should look like the one that's on my screen here. So as you can see on the left hand side, there's a small hand button. If at any time during the presentation you'd like to ask a question to the group, if you can click that, we'll be able to see that your hand is raised and then when we get a sec, we'll unmute you and you can ask your question and Tim will get back to you. You'll also see the questions panel here. So in here, this is just a place where you can type your questions to Tim and Sandy and we'll get back to you personally. And then you've got this little orange arrow here. That'll just minimise your screen, so your control panel, so that you can see the screen better. Um, so you can see the presentation in full. So I hope that all makes sense. Um, so that's it from me. I'll hand you over to Tim and Sandy who will take you through the webinar. So thank you, Tim and Sandy. Hi, everybody. Um, welcome for, to our webinar for this afternoon. Uh, Sandy's over at the side here. Say hello, Sandy. Hello. <laughs> She's a little quiet. Um, we're here today to talk about buying a cat to suit your plans. And on the title there, it has uh, not your budget. But of course, budget is a serious consideration. It's more your consideration than uh, the subject of this webinar. But it is something that you need to think about seriously going through some of the topics that we'll talk about today. Now, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself and Sandy. Um, where you can see the photos there of Sandy and I on uh, One Giant Leap at Helia 44 when we were delivering it to Sydney and of course my big noggin on the Tag 60 catamaran. So our experience so far um, was my background, I'm Master 5 and having worked on charter boats and various things like this, but Sandy and I developed a, a plan where we wanted to go sailing in the Pacific after living in the Solomon Islands for a while. And we bought one giant leap, a Helia 44. Our, our first boat, the Helia 44, was a fabulous boat. We loved it. We bought it new. Um, we had it fully optioned. We sailed up and down the east coast of Australia. Then we ended up going round the Pacific and uh, all the way up, ending up back in the Solomon Islands. Um, we dived off it. We went to very remote locations. And it was a fantastic living board, uh, living platform to cruise upon. But what we did decide when we got back to Australia was it was Sandy and I don't have children. And because we intended to go to quite remote places that were difficult to get to, we didn't have a lot of guests. So it was rather a big boat for us, we found. So the, we decided to sell the Helia 44 and we bought a Fusion 40, which was our second boat. Now this boat needed a bit of work and we bought it because we wanted to learn how to fix up a boat and be self-sufficient and all this sort of stuff. But in that period, uh, we ended up doing a lot of yacht deliveries as well. And over the last two years, we've now done 19,000 nautical miles on 16 different boats. So today we bring to you not only our experiences on these two boats, but also our contact with many of these clients, what they found with their boat purchases, some success stories, some not so successful stories, um, and a lot of the qualities of various boats for various cruising that, uh, that we spoke to with these clients. Now, I suppose when we go through all of this stuff and we get on to uh, what we're talking about when we want to buy a boat, is the decisions that we base our purchase upon. And we talk about uh, we'd all like to 
uh, sail a boat like Cato, which you can see down in front of you there, but quite often our budget leads us to have to sail something that you can see on the right hand side there. And it is an extreme of course, but these things have to be considered. Do we need the 67 foot tied up at the dock there? But we definitely need something more than the Hobie 14 on the trailer next to it. So when we talk about this today, we talk about what we need to do what we want to do. Added to that is what we want, what we want to do while we're doing it, and what we can afford when those two things are combined. So all of that, going through it, and when I say wants, I mean uh, the on top of the needs, you're talking about toys, and everyone loves toys, so they all have to go on the boat as well, and that all is incorporated, incorporated in your budget. So what I'm going to talk about is just a couple of uh, situations that we're exposed to where we delivered boats that they may not have been the wise, wisest choice. And I'm just going to discuss those for a second. So we've got sort of a, a base on which we can sort of uh, look at this webinar and what we're talking about today. Now the first client experience I'm going to talk about was a couple that bought their first boat and it was a Leopard 45, an ex-charter boat, uh, quite, a, quite a nice boat. Uh, it did need quite a bit of work and after purchase they expended a considerable amount of money on it. They didn't have a lot of experience. Their plans were just to cruise the Australian coastline. And when they, uh, after seven months of leaving Queensland and getting to Cairns, they ended up selling the boat. Uh, not only was the boat probably not the right boat for them for what they wanted, it was way too big, way too heavy and not what was needed for their plans. So their financial loss and their disappointment I think in their purchase may have impacted their decision to purchase another boat in future. So when we get back to talking about planning what we're buying or buying to suit your plans, they, they, they didn't think this through when they made that purchase. Now the, the second one I'll talk about is Lagoon 500. This is a fabulous boat. I mean this is uh, full of luxury, full of space, uh, seaworthy, big. For a 50 footer it's probably the biggest 50 footer on the market. Um, it has uh, accommodation to spare, it's got a fantastic galley that you can see down there, enough seating around that table for at least a dozen people. But it's a very big boat. Now I'll talk about these clients who, who purchased this boat and purchased it uh, as their first boat. And the boat they purchased was quite complex in how it was wired and configured and everything. So when they started to uh, move the boat around, they found it very difficult to manage in terms of uh, just running the boat. And they made it probably about 300 miles down the coast before it made it into another marina and a month later they sold it. Uh, that was a really disappointing experience for them and uh, we, I was on the delivery with them um, over this 300 miles and they were extremely upset by, by their inability to cope with this boat as new boat owners. Um, when they got to their destination, uh, I know the boat sat at the marina for a month or so before it was put on the market. So I don't think that was a very positive experience, once again, because they didn't clearly think about their plans and they purchased something that they thought would be fantastic but without a realistic expectation of how, uh, how to actually manage the boat and the experience required. So that were two not so successful stories of purchases by owners that hadn't clearly thought through their plans when buying a cat. Now this is why we're talking today. Um, to help you determine what you think you may need, 
um, what size you boat uh, you need to actually carry through your cruising plans, what sort of boat you may need to not only uh, carry through your cruising plans but to then accommodate all your toys and how that fits within your budgeting plans. Now I can't give you, as I said earlier, can't tell you what what to spend and what not to spend. That's not my, uh, my, my area of expertise. What I can talk to you about is the sort of boat for the sort of cruising that you, you can do. So when we uh, well move on, and this is a, a picture of, this is why we all go cruising. This is one giant leap crossing to New Caledonia. Uh, this sort of experience is what we're all after. And when you buy a boat like this, we want it to feel right. Not only does it have to fit our plans, fit our needs, also accommodate our wants, but it has to be the right boat for us. Now, I'll relate a bit of my experience here is Sandy and I, when we were buying a brand new boat, were sitting on a Lagoon 450, filling out the options list at Sydney Boat Show in 2012. We went, uh, got off the boat to walk around and have a think about what we wanted on this boat, stepped up to the Fontaine Fajot stand and saw video of the Helia 44 and bought one sight unseen. Why did we do that, you may ask? Because I couldn't look at the Lagoon 450 tied up at the dock and go, yeah, that's my boat. I didn't have that emotional connection to it. To this day, when I walk past one giant leap, who's now owned by someone else, I look at that boat with pride. I think it's a beautiful boat to look at and it has an emotional connection for me. So that's something else we have to think about when we're buying a boat. In other words, your boat's got to look hot to you. So when we're looking at these boats and deciding how we're going to go about finding out what we need, what we want, Finding out more. Uh, there's a little photo of in there of uh, our Fusion 40 and Sandy's uh, reusing of the windsurf sails there as sunshades. So I thought I'd add that in there. It's a bit of colour. Um, finding out more. Where do we go? First thing, of course, we all go is we Google. We get online and we have a look around. So what do we do? We go to Cruises Forum. I'd say about 90% of people go to Cruises Forum. There is some valuable information on cruising, Cruises Forum. It's hard to weed through a lot of the opinion, uh, a lot of the misinformation that's on there. People yeah, putting stuff out there that they think is the right thing. But there is a lot of information out there that is inaccurate or just plain wrong. Uh, as a mechanic I spoke to yesterday, he said mechanics, professional mechanics, they don't go home after a day at work and start putting their opinions out on Cruises Forum. It's usually people who may or may not have experience that put their opinion forth. I'll use an example is there is a man or a, a person, a correction, on Cruises Forum that has 3,900 uh, 3, and something odd posts. When you look at his uh, the boat that he owns, He's got planning to buy a 45 foot catamaran. He's been on Cruises Forum for seven years. He's still planning to buy a 45 foot catamaran. Without that experience of owning a boat and physically having to deal with all of those issues, you'd have to take what he says with a little bit of a grain of salt. Because owning a boat is an experience. Um, and we should talk to people who have that experience, not someone who just has an opinion. The other side of uh, research is going and chartering a boat. Now, up at the Wind Sundays, you can charter anything from a Seawind 1000 with outboards through to a Katana 45 and everything in between. And the most common boats up there are going to be the boats that accommodate the most people, of course. Everyone's in it to make money in the charter business. But it's a good idea to have a, a 
go out and charter one of those boats to see how they sail, to see how they motor, to see whether you can work in that galley, whether you can sleep in that small bunk or you've, if you've got a bigger bunk, um, sleep in that, that back cabin. Whatever questions you may have, charter is a great way to go about it. If you're looking at a smaller boat, the C1-1000, you can charter those. You can charter the bigger boats and as I said, if you want a performance cruiser, you can charter a Katana 45. And the other way to uh, conduct your research or find out more is ask someone who's done it. And I always say, if someone, uh, you ask someone and the first thing they say is, I think you should, well that's when you walk away because no one can tell you what you should do. You can get opinions and their experiences, but no one should just tell you what you should do because a boat is such a personal thing. The other thing about a charter boat is when you walk up to the dock and if you really like the look of the boat when you're just standing on the dock, well, maybe that's the one for you because you've already got an emotional connection to it. So finding out more, and I'm sure there's a lot of other avenues of, uh, of information out there. Uh, it's just up to you to go and speak to people. Uh, get online and just write down everything you hear in pros and cons column even, and, uh, and just continue to ask questions. Now, when, we, uh, when we've done all of that and we think, all right, we've looked at a few boats and we're starting to narrow it down, whether we want to go fast or whether we want to accommodate 20 people or whether we just want to pot around Pittwater or Moreton Bay or Port Phillip Bay, we're starting to get a bit of a clear idea of where we want to go. Now, where we, when we go out and we start to research stuff, we've got to remember that when we uh, look at a boat, it has to be capable of dealing with the weather, dealing with everything that we need it to do. So not just accommodation, not just getting out to the best dive spots, not just finding that nice little river, but also dealing with the sort of weather we've got here on the way to get there. So we want something that's well-founded, seaworthy um, and well set up. So when we look at what we need, we then look at our plans. So I've got here the boat triangle. So what we need uh, to, to satisfy what we're going to do, what we plan to do, is a combination of things. And if you want to go to the Pacific, for example, and I'll use that as the example because that's where we took the Helia, uh, how fast do you want to get there? Now the trip to New Caledonia from Coffs Harbour is six days at six knots in a straight line. You can do it in four days if you get something a little faster, but then because say we're looking at 45 feet, if you don't have that volume and it goes a little quicker because it doesn't have that volume, you lose on accommodation space. You also probably lose on load carrying capacity. Because speed requires slightly narrower hulls, maybe a higher bridge deck, maybe a little more beam, there's not that internal volume and because there's not that internal volume, it doesn't have the weight or the, the load carrying capacity and if you load it up, it then slows down. So it's a three-sided triangle. You can always go for speed, accommodation and load carrying capacity and you end up with the boat in the picture. Two and a half million dollars for the boat and it took 14 months to build. And you can see it's a beautiful vessel and it's, it's the height of luxury. But it takes money. So you can go to all three. Most of us are not in that position. Most of us have to manage a budget and manage that speed, accommodation and low carrying capacity to achieve what we want, uh, what we need for our plans, what we want and uh, what we can afford. So when we're considering all of the above, we can end up with something like uh, Mojo, which is a shining 
G1500, I think, uh, which has got carbon sales, and it will get you from Coffs Harbour to Numea in two and a half days, not six days. And it will sit on 18 to 20 knots. But once again, as I said earlier, with that boat, you lose an accommodation and load carrying capacity. If you want, if you're happy to do it in six days at six knots and not concerned that much about performance, you go to the other side of the equation. Now, I must admit, this is a boat I wouldn't mind uh, spending a couple of weeks on with all my friends and sailing slowly around the world, but it comes with its downside too. It doesn't have performance, but it does have space and accommodation and it does have load carrying capacity. So you can have those compressors, you can have that, that big tender with a centre console, you can have all the surfboards, stand up paddle boards, everything that you want. You can have the big, air uh, big um, generator set for the air conditioning. You can have it all, but look at the size of the boat and uh, what you sacrifice with that size is of course speed. That's a Lagoon 620, by the way, 62 feet and three storeys high. So, size, load carrying capacity. We have to think about what we want and what we what we need to do our plans and what we need on it. So, all of these equipment choices go back to what we need for our plans. Not once. Water, water maker size. Are you going to get a 12, 12 volt, 240 volt, which includes a gen set or engine driven? Tanks, you know, do you have big tanks for lots of water or do you have a small tank and rely on making water all the time? Power, how are you going to have power? Or are you going to run generators the whole time? Of course, those faster boats have solar and wind, but then the bigger boats with the load carrying capacity can have a gen set, which then runs washing machines, compressors, um, water makers, you know, where you can create 200 litres an hour. You can then start to have uh, significantly more electronics if required, communication domes, sat TV domes, um, sat phone domes. Uh, you can have extensive communications and also you can have a big sale wardrobe because sales weigh a lot. So these all, uh, all these things have to be thought about when you're looking or planning your where you want to go, the size boat you're going to buy and uh, its load carrying capacity. That boat triangle comes into play here. Now these equipment choices are pretty basic choices. There is a lot more we could go into but we're not going to go into it today. That is more uh, your choice, what you want, what you think you need to do what you want to do, uh, and there's a lot more that can go on the boat. So where we start to think about where we want to go. This is where we want to go. This is the Solomon Islands, and it's always good fun. You throw out a stern line, line it becomes the, the, the best toy set in the island. And before you know it, you've got a dozen kids hanging off the back. So this is, uh, the, I put these pictures in there just to remind us why we're going through all of this, uh, where we want to go and what we want to do. So everything is a compromise. Um, We've got there a little Lagoon 38. Now this is one of my favourite boats. It's an older model, they don't really make it anymore. It's got surprising volume for a little 38 footer, yet it has surprising performance. They're very popular and they're actually very scarce on the second hand market because they are such a nice little boat. They have that volume, that uh, small size, so they fit within a budget. And they also are quite quite quick. They don't they sail quite well, and because they've got the volume, you can put a bit of bit of equipment on them as well. The uh, the next one is the Mumby Forty Eight. It's aluminium, um, but because it's a performance boat, we've got that issue of the 
sort of uh, equipment you've got on it. Doesn't have a lot of volume, doesn't have a lot of buoyancy, so your speed's affected if you start to load it up. The other one down there on the left at the bottom is a Lapari 41. Uh, everything's a compromise, nothing's a perfect boat. But that's one of those, <coughs> excuse me, one of those perfect sizes that I think marry up um, size, performance, volume, and a little bit of fun stuff can go on there as well without too much affecting its speed. So that thing will sit on, you know, seven knots on a, on a, a trade wind run, maybe eight. The one next to it is a, uh, a Granger 1220. Thank you, Rachel. A Granger 1220. Um, and another really nice little sized 40 footer um, with sufficient volume, probably a little better performance than the Lapari, but the consequence is you do lose volume in the hulls and you do lose that accommodation. Um, you start to get to the point where the hulls uh, sit directional, as in the same direction as the hulls, and your partner has to climb over you to go to bed. That may or may not be a good thing, depending on how you look at it, I suppose. And up there on the right-hand side is one giant leap. And you can see I still have that emotional attachment to the boat. And this is why I bought, uh, we bought, sorry, the Helio 44 over the Lagoon 450. Just look at it. It's a cracker. Um, other people feel that way about the lagoons. It's a personal thing. So when we when we uh, work out what we need, so we've talked about our boat triangle. We talk about everything being a compromise, being size, cruising capability, volume, speed, all of those sort of things. When we start to hone in on what we actually need to buy in a boat, we have to look at what our plans are. Now you can have cruising areas of local, which I've got there, Moreton Bay, Great Sandy Strait. If you're in Sydney, Pittwater or the Harbour, um, if you're looking at doing weekend stuff, Port Phillip Bay, maybe Western Port Bay, um, <clears throat> sort of stuff, Wilson's Promontory, where we were just a few weeks ago doing a delivery from Melbourne, Refuge Bay, um, beautiful little locations, a little local area or some, you know, local slash cru uh, coastal cruising. You don't need a great big boat unless you choose to have 20 people with you, but if it's just you and your wife or you and your husband and you just want to uh, uh, explore your local area, you don't need 50 feet of boat. The other side, when you move up and you decide that, all right, I want to cruise around to, if you're in Melbourne, around to South Australia to have a look at the cruising areas around there and they're beautiful. Or if you're in Sydney, um, up to Queensland. Or if you're in Queensland, maybe you know down to Sydney. Uh, just coastal cruising, so a little more size. Uh, you may have to end up being you know, a few more miles offshore uh, so something a little bigger, maybe something with a little more volume because you might want to carry a little more load because you're going to explore a little further. Then you start to talk about, well, let's go offshore or remote. And I talk about this being the Pacific Islands. Because the Pacific Islands, you've, to get there, six days at six knots. Then to get between countries, say, if you do that, you know, uh, New Cal to Fiji, it's another 600 miles. Or if you go out to Tonga, it's another 600 miles. So these are offshore passages. Now, uh, as I said, we just, my, Sandy and I just brought a, a 46 foot Bahia, Fontaine Show Bahia, up from Melbourne. Uh, in seven and a half days, we experienced some quite rough weather, some quite strong winds and big seas. Now, what made the difference there was the size of boat uh, being 46 foot long and the, uh, the, the weight, I suppose, led it to, to be a little calmer in those seas, a little uh, smoother on the ride. If I was out in those winds in a Lagoon 38, for example, things may have been thrown around a little more. So if we're doing those sort of offshore remote places, I think you go up that, just that little bit in size because you're, you're going out a little further. Also, you have to look at uh, self-sufficiency. So to take all of those things that relate to self-sufficiency, 
you're going to want to think about size. Size to, uh, so you've got the load carrying capacity to carry all of that equipment. And there is a surprising amount of equipment. It's changing now, things getting smaller, things getting lighter, um, but still it's a surprising amount of equipment. Then there's passage making and circumnavigation. Whilst Australia to New Cal and Fiji is passage making, um, I'm talking crossing oceans. We start to look at boats in the 50 foot range, uh, high 40s, 50s, mainly because they have the sea keeping abilities. They are boats that if they get in a big sea will cope better than a smaller boat with more comfort, more speed, and speed is an important consideration when you're doing crossing oceans because you may need to outrun weather systems, for example. So those sort of boats become uh, bigger just to handle that sort of thing. And we've got a question that's come up and I'll read this question out from Fiddy Jose. Um, hi, plan in 2019 to cruise around Indonesia for two or three years after maybe New Cal and Vanuatu. Two kids, four years, uh, and my wife, Indonesian, can even drive a car. So I'll be single-handed. Budget 2000, um, what boat will fit us? Well, that's a question uh, that I can't really answer at the moment because you have to decide. Uh, it's coastal cruising, going up to Indonesia. It's a pop. You've got one decent stretch over to the islands once you leave Australia, about 600 miles. But with four kids, your load carrying capacity is important. Um, your equipment, because you're going to be single-handed, uh, and your budget is for you to decide as to what you can afford. But for something like that, with the kids, uh, I don't think you're all going to squeeze into a 30-foot boat. Uh, so I think about something a bit bigger than 30 feet. But for that sort of thing, coastal cruising, you could probably get something that would accommodate you all in the 40 to 45-foot range. Um, I hope that answers your question. Um, all right, we'll move on now. So, yes, all right, I've lost track a little bit there. Please excuse me. Now, when you are looking at all of these boats, the other things that you may want... All right, so the other thing you may want to think about in addition to those cruising areas um, when you're looking at these sort of boats is... Uh, your entertaining area, your ability to accommodate 20 odd people, all the electrical mod cons, AC to every cabin, ice maker, five fridges, scuba compressor, Titanic sized tender and 300 nautical miles a day. That's not going to happen if you want all of those toys. So as I said earlier, everything is a compromise. Now what I've got here is I've got a local cruising page and the sort of boat that I think would be perfect for local cruising. Now this is a Raven 30, which is actually just sold um, by the uh, Gold Coast Office of Multi Hull Solution. And Sandy and I, uh, we sailed this out of Sydney and we thought it was a beautiful little boat. It was over engineered uh, to the extreme because it was sailed from South Africa to Sydney. Now there I've just talked about local cruising, coastal cruising and circumnavigation, you need 50 feet. You don't need 50 feet, as evidenced by this. You can sail it in a 30 footer. But would you really want to? Probably not. Um, the story, the, the owner of this boat told us the story of the delivery skipper uh, being a couple of times underwater and looking out and seeing green, green water over the top. So this boat continued to pop to the surface. Uh, that would have been quite a frightening experience. And I doubt if you had have done that with your wife, uh, whether you would have got her on the boat once you'd reached Australia ever again. So that's to say you can do it in this boat, a Raven 30, but it's more suited to 
tooling around the bays, Morton Bay, Port Phillip Bay. Um, it's a great little sailor. It has a nice little uh, two uh, double bunks. It's got a bathroom. It's got a really nice little galley. Um, it's got some solar which manages its fridges. It's a really good little cruiser and it's solid, a really solid little boat. So, and the other ones for local cruising, although once again, we know people, uh, next phase, which you see here, is a Sea Wind 1000. I say local cruising. Um, I actually spent five weeks on one of these cruising up through the Great Barrier Reef many years ago. And three of us lived on it quite comfortably because it was hot, the whole thing opens out, and it's, it's, a, it's a great um, open plan boat for cruising around locally. It's only 30 feet, so it is quite small. Um, but Sandy and I brought one of these from Sydney to the Gold Coast. And it was quite a quick little boat. They're a good sailor, but they do have, like every boat, they have a downside. Um, I think the outboards are great for a boat this size, but the fuel tanks are under the floor in the saloon. And there is a slight odour of petrol sometimes. But they are a good sailor. They're a good accommodation boat. Uh, they're fun. They're open plan, so they're great for entertaining. Um, and I think they're a good one for, and you see lots of them in Sydney Harbour, and you see lots of them in Moreton Bay. They're a great weekend cruiser. So here I've got a couple of suggestions for coastal cruising. And when I say coastal cruising, it's like that trip that Sandy and I have just done from Melbourne to Mooloolaba. Uh, all of these boats, I've brought a, boat, a Mahi 36 up from Sydney to uh, Mooloolaba in five metre seas, and it handled it extremely well. Uh, the other one down there is one of my very favourite boats, a Tasman 35. And we brought one of these down from Mackay uh, down to the Gold Coast. Once again, a fantastic little sailor, great accommodation. Um, they're both really good little boats for coastal cruising. But I've put them in that coastal cruising uh, uh, category because they do lack a little bit of accommodation space. They are quite small in being 35 feet and 36 feet, but they're fantastic little boats. They're fun to sail, they're fast. Um, but they don't have that load carrying capacity that maybe some other boats do have. The other ones we put in the coastal cruising, the Lucia 40. Now uh, this is a bigger boat. It's the new 40 footer from Fontaine Peugeot. Uh, I'm sorry I don't have the Lagoon 39 in there, which probably uh, has more accommodation space and is just as good a sailor as the Lucia. But you can see there, we're starting to get to a boat that is almost a bit more than a coastal cruiser. You could certainly sail this you know, around the islands or as someone else did uh, in that 40, 41 foot range, they sailed a boat back from France and it was a Lapari 41. So this is quite capable of doing those ocean trips, but it probably would not be as comfortable as a bigger boat. And uh, you'd want to pick your weather windows quite quite seriously. But the Lucia 40, you can see fantastic accommodation, fantastic galley, great electronics, fantastic view. Um, it's a really nice boat. Now, the other one is the Fusion 40, which, uh, which we currently own. Now, because it's a bit more of a performance cruiser, it's a bit more fun to sail, um, you sacrifice a little bit of room down in the hulls. And that bottom left photo, you can almost see there how narrow the holes are and how wide the beam is. Uh, so, but what that does give you is a lot of accommodation space in the saloon area. They are quite big because of their beam. It's just the accommodation downstairs is not as big as some other boats. Offshore cruising. We've got the Helia 44, of course. Um, we love this boat. It's got heaps of volume as evidenced by when you look at that forward view in the centre, look at the width of those hulls. There's a lot of accommodation there. 
um, because it's got a, a decent bridge deck clearance um, and it's got quite a high saloon roof, there is a lot of accommodation area in the saloon as well. In terms of load carrying capacity, you can see on the bottom left, that was a wedding and we had 19 people on board, we still had room to spare. Uh, we had a party on board up at the Whitsundays, we had 21 guests and there was still spare seating. So it is quite a big vessel, but for offshore cruising, um, and if you had a few people on board, it has that space and accommodation. It's not the quickest boat in the world, but certainly um, is a great living platform for extended cruising. As you can see in the cockpit up there, we had a, an extended family over to watch movies one day, but it does seat a lot of people and there's seating for another 10 or 12 people in that cockpit as well. There's a photograph down the bottom right hand side. Not only am I showing off my fishing prowess, but it gives you an idea of the galley size. It's got a nice big galley, but that's 44 feet and 13 tonnes. Obviously, for this sort of cruising, we're going up in size and up in weight, therefore up in stability and up in load carrying capacity. We had paddle boards, dive compressors, scuba tanks, you name it on that boat. Sorry. Yes. Whenever you ready. Oh, sorry. Um, I've just been informed there's a question here. <laughs> okay, we've already talked about that one. Yeah. Um, okay. So the other one um, I've got here, looking at offshore cruising. Yeah, so um, offshore cruising is a boat that I really like, which is currently on the market, which is a Granger 443XC. I'm not sure whether I like this boat just because it's called a Granger 433XC, but it is a really nice looking boat. Now this one would probably be a little more performance oriented than the Helia, but once again, it comes down to with that performance comes that loss of volume and that loss of accommodation. But it's still, being 43 feet, has quite a nice saloon area. Um, it has a little bit of a, a more cramped cockpit than the Helia, as you can see down the bottom there. Um, and the engines are further forward under the um, back cabin bunks. Now the, the, being the engines being further forward, of course, moving the weight further forward and getting a better balance boat. But once again, you've got that loss of volume, um, you've got performance, but whether you can add too much to that, how much load that will carry, I don't know. And you can see in that picture, there's not much on it because it's riding fairly high in the water. But it's uh, full epoxy, strong as all get out. Range is a great design. Um, and it's one of my favourites on the on the second hand market at the moment. I can see we've got a hand up there. Who's got there? Uh, Fitty Joe. Now I'm not sure how we. Do you want to try that one? Okay. Sorry, we're just trying to figure out the the question. Uh, I'm not sure whether we have to respond to that. Uh, okay, I'll, yeah, it's self-muted. I'll keep going. Um, but yeah, the Granger 433XC, I like this boat. Um, the circumnavigation category that we talk about here, our Sandy and I sailed one of these from Perth to the Gold Coast. We went 300, metre, 300 miles south to pick up the southwest winds. Um, whilst we didn't have huge winds, we did have uh, nine to 12 metre seas for a few days there. This boat sails fantastically. I thought it was a fantastic boat to do that trip on. We ended up being over 600 miles offshore across the bike, um, and it was a fantastic boat for that sort of trip. I know of lots of these that have circumnavigated um, 
circumnavigated uh, from Europe on, on their way back to Europe via Australia. Um, there's currently two of these in Australia on the market. Uh, they're no longer made, but they are one of my favourite sailing, larger sailing boats. As you can see downstairs in the owner's suite, there is heaps, acres of space down there to make it a suitable liveaboard. It's just fantastic. The bed is a king size walk around. You've got a fully enclosed um, self-contained bathroom with separate toilet there. You can see up here the saloon is enormous with a, a nav desk. You've got fantastic uh, seating uh, on the left there and a fantastic galley. But like I said, no boat is perfect. And when you have a look at that photograph of the saloon area, just on the right where you can see the galley, you'll see some cupboards up the top there. If on that trip I hit my head once on those cupboards, I did it a dozen times a day. And I was frustrated and I couldn't understand why the designers put those cupboards at head height above the galley on a boat. Um, as I said, I love this boat all except for that head high cupboard. Everything's a compromise. The other ones I've got in here are Chingogan 52, which is just pulled up next to us, and a Katana 48. Uh, the people who uh, bought the Chingogan 52 next to us with express plans, with very clear plans to uh, circumnavigate, and they wanted that site. But being experienced owners, having had a 35 foot performance cruiser before, they knew exactly what they wanted. You'll see on your screen now, Rosella, another one of my favourite boats. This one has just sold. Uh, it's a uh, seven, waterline 17.5 metre by 9.5 metre. This thing will get up and boogie at 25 knots all day. Do it with comfort, do it with class, and the downstairs accommodation areas you can see are just huge. Now it gets that volume from its width and its size and its load carrying capacity that comes with that. So this would be a fantastic boat to sail the world with four kids, um, with a lot of people. Uh, it's got lots of room for partying and it's got lots of entertaining in the, in the um, cockpit. So I've talked about those, those areas of cruising being local, coastal, offshore and circumnavigation. Now those bigger boats, yes, they're for circumnavigation, but those offshore boats I mentioned, they're probably what I would choose for that type of cruising, but lots of them have circumnavigated, probably in a little less comfort than these bigger boats. Um, as I said, in that boat I've mentioned for coastal cruising, People have sailed them around the world. Someone sailed the Pari 41 from France. Um, you can do it, but probably just in a little less comfort. Or the other example is the Raven 30. Some crazy man sailed it from South Africa across the Indian Ocean. Um, you can do it. It's not very comfortable though, and uh, I probably wouldn't choose to, but you can do it. And that one was over-engineered to do just that. So you can sail anywhere you want to go, but in terms of uh, safety, comfort, um, I think you choose a boat that's appropriate for the plans that you have. Now, I've talked about all of these boats. I've talked about um, uh, having uh, plans, making sure you know clear plans, where you want to go, what you want to do. I talked about that compromise of boats and the boat triangle, speed, comfort, accommodation and low carrying capacity. So these are all decisions that you have to make and uh, the guy who asked the question earlier saying he's going to Indonesia with four kids, um, you asked me what sort of boat to buy. I can't tell you what sort of boat to buy because you guys might be happy in a 30 footer but then again I suggest something around the 45 foot mark. But it comes down to how much room your kids need, how much room you feel you need. Do you want an owner's version that has privacy? Are you happy to have a kid in each cabin? Uh, it's really up to you. But all of, those, uh, all of those things come down to choices. And I'm talking here about uh, the choices you have to source your catamaran. 
Uh, obviously, buying new, what do you get? We bought new. Um, we get a tried, true design. Well, in fact, ours was hull number seven. It wasn't a tried and true design, but it was from designers, world-renowned designers from a world-renowned company uh, producing a new design. And the design aspect was so successful on that boat that they have used those principles in the rest of their design, being the Lucia 40, uh, the Saba 50, and their new 47 footer coming out. The same flow through characteristics of that boat um, are, are followed right through their line now. So yes, we've got tried and true design uh, expertise from a, a, a reputable company. The other thing about new is you get support and advice on what you can put on that boat, how to go about doing it, what you need to do to go where you want to go. But with that support and advice, you get to set it up how you want to set it up. And if you've got experience before, uh, or you've had a boat before and you go out and buy a new boat, I'm pretty sure you have very specific ideas about how you want your boat set up. And the other side of buying new, you get the reliability of new products and fittings. Boats wear out. They wear out quickly. Um, they're in a harsh environment, being the marine environment, and they have to be maintained. And things you know, do wear out. So having new products and fittings is a big plus in a new boat. The next option, which is the option of, of many people, is buying pre-owned. Uh, it is uh, sometimes a more budget-oriented option because you can buy a cheaper boat that's already fully equipped. Um, but I've got their Bristol condition. And Bristol conditions means that boat being in the best possible condition, the best example uh, to the point where it's, it's better than you. Uh, how close to Bristol condition? And what would be the price of a vessel of that type and that age in Bristol condition? Well, that's where your, your benchmark starts from and you work down from there. So your Bristol condition in uh, a Fusion 40, for example, one that we bought, we didn't get a Bristol condition or a perfect boat. We got a boat that required quite a bit of work because we chose that and the price reflected that. Um, it wasn't fully equipped, but we have fully equipped. So if we sold it now, people would get a boat that has water makers, has gensets, has all of that new equipment that's required. Um, the question mark is uh, if you buy a pre-owned boat, for example a 2007 boat now um, would more than likely require new standing rigging and would be a requirement to obtain insurance. So buying pre-owned, that question of the quality and the state of repair and how that equipment has been maintained becomes a question. So with new, it's re reliability of new products and fittings. With pre-owned, the equipment is questionable because you don't know how it's been maintained. So, and the age, and, uh, the age of the boat and required repairs. Um, and the other option is build. You get exactly what you want, can fit it exactly as you want it. Now there's a couple that have built their own boat just across uh, the way from us, and it's a work of art. I'll be upfront and say this is a beautiful, beautiful boat. Um, if, he, if the builder does not add into the cost of the boat his time and labour, it's a cheap option. If you add in his time and labour, it is probably not the cheapest option in terms of obtaining a boat. Also, uh, this gentleman is an extremely skilled builder, or more his attitude is nothing is, is good enough. It's got to be perfect, and this boat reflects that. But to achieve that finish, uh, he spent four years building it, and he says it sent him grey. It's the second boat he's built. And this one is the one, it's the last boat he's ever going to build and they plan to live on it and cruise to wherever they want to go. It's 45 feet long and it is perfectly capable of going wherever they want to go. And the other aspect to building a boat is they built their boat on a shed on land that they owned. 
If you have to lease a shed to build your boat, it then starts to become an even more expensive option. So what we've talked about today is all of these plans that you make, buying a boat that you need to satisfy those plans, buying a boat that not only satisfies those needs but will accommodate all of your wants. Um, if you like to party with 20 people, maybe you need a boat slightly bigger. And also is uh, capable of going to those places that you want in relative comfort in terms of size and load carrying capacity with all your toys. Um, we've talked about the sort of boats that I would choose to do local cruising, coastal cruising, offshore cruising and circumnavigation. They may not be the boats that you would choose, but that's just how I feel about it. And the other one we've talked about is your choices in obtaining a boat. You notice here, I haven't mentioned budget too much. Budget is pretty much your call. We'd all like to sail a boat called you know, Kator that's 67 feet, built of carbon fibre and epoxy, uh, will travel everywhere at 25 to 30 knots, will accommodate 20 people, uh, will do it in absolute luxury and style. But I don't know about you, but I don't have $3 million to spend on a boat. Um, if that is your budget, all well and good. If like most of us, where I'll have to be a little more circumspect on how much we buy, uh, spend on a boat, then those sort of things start to come into play. Uh, and what we need, what we want and what we need um, have to be compromised a little bit and toned down a little bit. So I hope I've given you some information to think about. I did not intend to tell you what sort of boat to buy and I can't tell you what sort of boat to buy because I'm not you. I can't tell you how much money to spend because I'm not you. But hopefully what I have given you is something to think about. Something to write down and sit down with your partner if you plan what do you want to do and how do you want to get there. And don't say in 10 years time we're going to go cruising to Indonesia. Think about what you plan to do next year or if you, if you are looking to buy a boat now, what you plan to do next year. If you're looking at buying a boat next year, what you plan to do in the years after that. And my last comment before I sign off will be, be realistic. Don't um, buy a boat based on fantasy. Be realistic of what you can do. If it's your first boat, plan to sail between here and the Whit Sundays a couple of times to get experience. Don't think that you're going to buy a boat and head off to South Africa right now because it just isn't going to happen. So my recommendation would be buy what you need, combine with what you want and get some experience. So hopefully I've helped you out and if uh, there's anything anyone wants to question uh, me on, you can go on Facebook and on Facebook we have a page called Beach Space Diving and Marine. If you look up Beach Space, I'm pretty sure it's the only one. That's Beach uh, Space or one word. And send me a message and I'll answer best I can. Um, if you want thinking about a particular type of boat and I've delivered that type of boat um, and we have delivered most brands of boats on the market, maybe I can give you my thoughts on it. Um, if you're not on Facebook, you can email me direct on beachspace at bigpond.com. That's B-E-A-C-H-S-P-A-C-E or one word lowercase at bigpond.com. Um, I'm perfectly happy to help you as best I can. Please don't hesitate to contact me if that's what you'd like. Now, if anyone has any questions, um, now's probably the time to do it at the end and I'll answer them if I can. Um, feel free, fire them at me. Thank you, Tim. So if anyone has any questions, if you'd just like to put up your hand or you can type it in the question box. Um, and we will see how we can help you.
All right, we're just waiting for some questions to come up. Uh, we haven't signed off, we're still here. And I don't know, what's that one? That was the one that you answered earlier. Oh, okay. Yeah. Ah, Selena. Ah, a Selena 48, possible single-handed. Any boat is possible single-handed. Uh, it's just a matter of setting up your boat uh, sufficiently so you can handle it single-handed. That 67 footer um, is designed and built to be sailed single-handed. Um, single-handed sailing on a boat of that size does require some planning and some financial input. If you've got the money to throw at it, um, you can do anything. Uh, the Selena 48, I would say that you are going to need some assistance sailing that one uh, without significant changes to how you actually do it. It's because of the Selena 48, and particularly uh, you're going up around Indonesia, uh, their reefing arrangements, they have one single line reef, uh, but apart from that, the second and third reef is from a strap which goes through an eyelet and to a snap shackle on the other side. And you go back to the boat, uh, back to the helm station, and haul in the reefing line at the back. So it is a two-part operation for second and third reefs. Uh, so you may require some assistance, or if you trust your autopilot, um, you can do it by yourself. But make sure you hook on, mate. Always hook on. Okay. Barry Jones, what would you say is the minimum size in feet for blue water cruising? I, uh, I would say for comfortable blue water cruising, I would like that 40 to 45 feet. Now, I did meet in Vanuatu an old tugboat driver, Bill, who'd uh, bought a, a, a bit of a wreck of a boat and fixed it up himself. And he said a minimum of 41 feet for any blue water crossing. I'd have to agree with that. I think that 40 foot plus is uh, a bit of a minimum just for comfort and how the boat gets thrown around. Um, if you're trying to get, say, from Newcal across to uh, the bottom island in Vanuatu, it's a beam sea with a, with a uh, trade wind, and you think, I'm in 40 feet of boat that weighs 10 knots, all of a sudden you're watching your kettle fly six feet through the air. It's one of those things where I think there is a minimum size, and I'd say 40 to 45 feet uh, for comfort and 40 to 40 or 45 feet of course gets better anything bigger than that it's just size and its ability to handle the seas but to answer your question minimum 41 feet hope that answered for you barry uh what else have we got there yes we've got selena i can't tell you whether your 2000 euros a month budget is realistic uh, it seems like a lot of money for sailing indonesia uh, that's third, about $3,500 Australian per month. I don't know, I don't have kids, how much do they cost? Um, so yeah, but it seems like a lot of money, particularly in Indonesia where prices would be considerably cheaper. Uh, what you have to remember with the Selena 48 though, uh, it's not just your running costs. Once you have a boat that big, you've got to find somewhere to put it if you want a marina and that costs. If you want to haul it out, you've got to find somewhere that can haul out a 48 footer. Um, so that $3,500 a month, I wouldn't spend it all up front, I'd save it for when you need to anti-foul and haul a boat out and stuff like that. Uh, Barry, is it cheaper to buy a cat in the med compared to Australia? Uh, it depends what you want to do. Uh, there is a lot of boats in Europe that um, are cheaper and we do have friends that have bought a boat in Italy and brought it back to Australia and did get a very basic boat but a pretty good deal. Now remember they spent, I think they spent somewhere in the vicinity of $70,000 shipping it back but they're not paying GST or import duty because they're taking it to New Zealand. They live in Australia but they're New Zealanders so they're not paying import duty. So factor that into your plans and, uh, and find out if, uh, if you can afford 
if, if it matches a price of a boat purchased in Australia. Remember in the Med you've got to get it here if you want to bring it here, if you're not going to leave it in the Med and go over there and sail it. Um, I'm hoping that uh, answers your question and thanks Barry Jones for joining us. And you. Okay, thanks Barry. Um, I don't think there's any more questions on the board uh, and if that's it, <laughs> Thanks, Barry. That's cool, man. Um, if there's nothing else, uh, please feel free to contact me outside this forum. Uh, thanks for being with us today and uh, good luck finding your boat. It's out there. you just got to look hard. Thanks for joining us.